you see and you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Alessandro. Thank you, Nico, Melody, and the entire team for organizing this great event. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to participate, even uh, remotely and with 10 hours time difference. Um, today, I would like to talk about nuclear fission um, and about um, how symmetry restored density functional theory might be used um, to better understand some aspects uh, of the process. Uh, all of the work that I'm going to talk about has been uh, performed over the last uh, year or so, so it's a uh, pretty um, fresh material. Um, to start with, fission, as you all know, is a process in which a heavy nucleus splits into two or more fragments and releasing a significant amount of energy uh, in the process. Uh, understanding fission is important both for fundamental and for practical purposes. To start with, um, fission is a key ingredient in our modeling of formation of uh, nuclear elements. It helps us produce energy, it is useful in medicine, uh, and of course it is important for the questions of national security. Despite the fact that we've known about fission for almost or about 80 years now, a comprehensive theoretical framework is still well out of our reach. Um, the reason, the primary reason for that might be the fact that the process does not look so much like this as it actually looks like this, where we can have either absorption of a projectile or the fission proceeds uh, spontaneously uh, from around the ground state all the way to a highly deformed scission state where the uh, system splits in two and then these two fragments de-excite through a series of possible processes. So, any comprehensive theoretical framework that would tackle this problem would have to answer uh, multiple, uh, would have to face numerous challenges, um, not least of which is the fact that the size of the system is too big to be able to apply any um, ab initial methods, but on the other hand, of course, it's too small for a statistical treatment. The nuclear interaction that we use between protons and neutrons is only partially known, and of course, also the electromagnetic interaction and the weak interaction play a role in some of the processes. We are dealing here with extreme deformations, which poses some additional challenges with respect to computational implementations. Um, there's a variety of processes included, as I said, there's induced fission, spontaneous, beta delayed, and so on. And also we have to account for a variety of time scales. For example, when it comes to a spontaneous fission, uh, the, life, the half lives between different nucleates can actually differ for as much as 30 uh, degrees of freedom. So there's a lot to deal with here, and the common wisdom is to try to uh, solve the piece of the puzzle, um, each piece separately. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So in the first part, I'm going to be talking about the possibility of improving this part of the equation, uh, how to uh, describe a system going from the ground state to the uh, position point. And in the second part, I'm going to be talking about very recent, actually preliminary calculations that we have uh, with respect to the properties of, the, of some fission fragments. All right, um, this is the, um, the schedule for today. Uh, I would like to first take a step back and talk about uh, density functional theory, uh, which is a theoretical framework that we use. Uh, it is often also referred to as energy density functional framework, which is in fact more precise. Uh, but DFT is commonly, it's commonly used, and here I just use this term and stick to it throughout the whole lecture. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, a recent development uh, with respect to using symmetry restored density functional theory in fission. In particular, with a, uh, I'm going to talk about a practical um, development, practical implementation that we did in order to make this kind of studies possible. Then I'm going to talk about a preliminary calculation that we have with respect to angular momentum of fission fragments from a microscopic theory. And of course, finally, I'm going to conclude and give some guidances for uh, future research. Density functional theory provides a global and microscopic framework for nuclear studies. Uh, global here means that uh, framework, uh, the functions that we use can, are applicable across the entire nucleus chart. And microscopic means that we actually deal with protons and neutrons as relevant to degrees of freedom. It is rooted in a mean field approximation where we start from a complex system of interacting particles and substituted by a much simpler system of free particles that move in a mean field. And in the next step, we can also neglect the substructure of these particles and treat protons and neutrons as basically point-like. This enables us to describe our system in terms of simple product type wave functions, so something like Slater determinants, 
and it also provides an intuitive picture of the form nuclear shapes. However, as we all know, there's no free lunch, at least not on online conferences. So there's always a price to pay. And the price here is the symmetry breaking. That is the fact that this type of simple product type weight functions do not preserve the symmetry of nuclear Hamiltonian. And consequently, they do not carry good quantum numbers. So for example, whenever we have a shape which is deformed in space, a rotational symmetry is broken and the total longer momentum is not a good quantum number and neither are its projections on an intrinsic or laboratory axis. The inclusion or pairing or finite temperature are gonna break the number of particle symmetry. Um, odd multiple deformations, so uh, octopole and so on, uh, are gonna break the parity, the reflection symmetry. And finally, the near localization of the mean field are gonna, is gonna make the linear momentum not a good quantum number anymore. Um, however, not everything is lost, of course, and there are many developed methods um, to restore these symmetries and to recover a good quantum number. Um, in essence, the level of symmetry breaking is monitored by an order parameter Q, which is a complex number whose module measures um, the amount of symmetry breaking and the phase um, kind of refers to, to um, orientation of the symmetry broken state in a, um, in a collective space related to, um, to symmetry breaking. Um, what we in a very crude terms do to restore these symmetries is that we combine states with a different uh, phi, with different orientation. And here I show an example of a rotational symmetry where we have a symmetry broken state, which is deformed in space. And in order to restore the symmetry, we combine different multiple states with different orientations. So in this case, the phi is, are gonna be three Euler angles in space. And once we do that, we end up with a state that is on average spherical and which preserves uh, obviously rotational symmetry. Um, this is routinely performed in nuclear structure studies. And here I just show an illustration of a rotational spectra where we can start from a mean field state. And then after restoring the angular momentum symmetry, we end up with an ex entire excitation uh, rotational spectrum. All right, this is if you wanna deal with one mean field state. What if we want to take a whole series of states, then we end up with a potential energy surface, uh, which is gonna encode the energy as a function of collective variable. This collective variable is usually a deformation parameter, quadrupole, octopole, and so on, or it can also be related to pairing and other um, collective variables are possible as well. On the left, I show a schematic representation of such one dimensional potential energy surface, uh, where a collective variable is the elongation, and we can actually follow a uh, nucleus going from a, a spherical state to the ground state, the first barrier, the isomeric state, the second barrier, and then through the slope down to the scission point where the nucleus splits in two. In practical implementations, uh, we usually use more than one collective variable. And here I show a realistic calculation of plutonium 240 with hartford bogolyubov framework. Uh, where on X axis, again, we do have uh, elongation, but Y axis now uh, is an octopole deformation, which measures uh, mass asymmetry of the system. Uh, in practice, we want to include as many collective variables as possible, but of course their number is limited by uh, computational resources that we have at hand. Potential energy surfaces are used to infer important quantities. Uh, for example, if we want to calculate the half-lives of spontaneous fission, we have to calculate the tunneling probabilities. And for these, uh, potential energy surfaces are a key ingredient. Then also all of these states on a surface can be used as a basis state for more involved methods that mix them in, uh, within a configuration mixing approaches. Um, for example, there are also the time dependent approaches, which uh, in essence uh, use a wave packet, which is propagated on top of such a surface. And then when it comes to a decision point, we can calculate uh, properties of fission fragments. Um, however, the present models that are at hand uh, use symmetry breaking potential energy surfaces, and this has multiple disadvantages. Um, for example, um, if we do not have a good angular momentum of the system, we cannot really discriminate between a neutron induced and gamma induced um, fission because the compound nucleus is the same, but the angular momentum content uh, can be uh, significantly different. Um, in addition, of course, if the potential energy surface is uh, modified, then any type of propagation on the surface is going to be modified as well. So this will influence dynamics and also the characteristics of fragments that are extracted um, from such a dynamics. 
Uh, the question is, can we just apply the usual symmetry restoration strategies that I uh, discussed before um, in the case of fission? And the answer is no. Uh, and you can take that from a very recent review paper on symmetry restoration, uh, which says this strategy increases the computational cost and becomes impractical in some situations like fission, where the large variety of shapes involved will require huge rotation invariant basis. Uh, to see what I mean here, we have to go a bit more mathematical. And here I show a symmetry restored state and how it is obtained. So we have an integral over rotational angles. This is the combination that combining multiple states that I, that I mentioned uh, on a scheme. Here we have just one angle because we assume axial symmetry, so integrate only over beta. Um, we have a point on our potential energy surface, and we have a rotation operator which rotates it in space. Um, this state is typically um, expanded in a single particle basis. So we use a basis that we know easily how to generate. And this is typically the eigenstates of harmonic oscillator. Here I show just a schematic representation of a harmonic oscillator, its states, and then actually shells. Each of these uh, shells is degenerated in energy and we have multiple states uh, within each shell. All of the existing models, um, when they do expansion in harmonic oscillator basis, uh, they do expansion in complete shells. So they cannot take only one of these states, they have to take the full shell. And this is the problem because as we can see here, the number of basis states that we have to take into account grows quite rapidly with the number of oscillator shells. So here I just show two numbers. If you want to take the full 15 um, shells, uh, there's around 800 states. And then some of the quantities are going to depend on the square of this number, such as densities, and it's going to be um, 600,000. But if you want to take the full 30 shells, then this is almost 5,500 states, and this is 30 million n squared, and this very quickly becomes um, non-feasible in practical implementations. The obvious solution would be to reduce the basis by considering only incomplete shells, so considering only states that are uh, more relevant. However, such bases are not closed under rotation, which makes the um, typical symmetry restoration framework uh, not applicable. Uh, the solution to this problem uh, was actually proposed in 94 by Luis Robledo, who I understand should be speaking the next, so it's a good <laughs> introduction. Um, and uh, the solution is actually to reformulate the Wick theorem. Now I know at this point, most of the listeners will maybe not know even what the theorem is, and I don't have obviously time to discuss it. We can just say that it's a theorem that helps us uh, calculate all of the important quantities in the framework. Um, and here I just show an example of one of the quantity, which is an overlap between the original state and the state which is rotated in, in, um, in space. Um, and here uh, the experts are going to recognize how the overlap is modified, since this is the thing that we have in a conventional framework. And this is a part uh, that enters into play uh, here. And it's a determinant of a rotational matrix. So in a case when we have a complete basis and a spherical basis, this is going to be one and then we recover the, uh, the old framework. Uh, however, in an incomplete basis, this is going to be different than one, and then uh, the, everything changes. And we can write up, of course, uh, expressions for other, other important quantities, such as densities, in a similar manner. And this is what we did. Uh, we proposed the first symmetry restoring model in uh, bases that are not closed under rotations. This, ena this enabled us to reduce the size of the bases drastically, so we take uh, states from up to 30 shells, but we only can uh, only take around 1100 states. Um, so this reduces the size drastically and still enables us to get a very good convergence. Uh, a few details for experts. It's a uh, skirm hartifog bogolyubov uh, model. We assume axial symmetry, and this is in principle done in an HOB DHO code. We restore rotational, particle number, and parity symmetry uh, simultaneously. Uh, bear in mind that the computational effort is still tremendous to do this kind of calculation, but is made feasible by a hybrid OpenMP plus MPI parallelization and by usage of uh, high performance computing. And then this for the first time enables us uh, an access to arbitrarily heavy uh, and or deformed uh, symmetry restored uh, configurations. Uh, this type of framework can be used for multiple purposes, including nuclear structure studies. Um, our first uh, study was case of fission of plutonium 240. Um, and what we did is that we took the uh, potential energy surface and we performed the projections. So here I show on the upper left panel is the projection on particle number projection and uh, on the particle number and zero plus uh, spin parity. And here is the same for one minus spin parity. 
the surfaces contain 1,150 configurations, and the basis is the one that I discussed uh, beforehand. In the lower panel, I show the difference between each of these surfaces and the hearty fog bogolivo, so the symmetry breaking surface that I show on one of the previous slides. And actually, by seeing, looking at the difference, we can see what is the effect of symmetry restoration and where do we get the most correlation energy. Uh, and in the case of zero plus state, we see that our gain is mostly at low uh, octopole deformations, Q3 zero, which might imply, might imply that the symmetric fission um, uh, is going to be enhanced. Um, for the one minus state, we see that there's a significant gain uh, along the least energy uh, fission path, path uh, which then might, um, might suggest that the fragment distributions are going to be broader. In order to kind of quantify this, uh, we also performed a calculation with Felix, which is a uh, time-dependent GCM plus uh, Gaussian uh, approximation for overlaps uh, model. In essence, what it does is it solves this Schrodinger equation where G are going to be collective A functions that are in time propagated on this type of surface. And H is a collective Hamiltonian, which is written here, and it has a kinetic part and a potential part. Um, what we did in this study is we modified the potential part. So instead of symmetry breaking energies, we put symmetry restored energies. However, we do not modify the inertias. And this is a, uh, a big assumption to assume that they do not change. And eventually, um, a comprehensive framework will have to account for this. But at the moment, this is the best that we can do. So we, we, we decide to live with this kind of approximation. And what we obtain here are the mass yields uh, for fission of 240 on HFB level and for the two projected surfaces, on the 0 plus and 1 minus. And we can see that, in fact, for the 0 plus, we do get enhancement of asymmetric, uh, asymmetric fission. And for the 1 minus, we also do get the broadening of the of the distribution. Um, as I said, this is just uh, preliminary and we have to, in fact, to, uh, to get the real distributions, we have to um, calculate projected inertias. Uh, we also have to assume some kind of spin distributions uh, for, um, uh, for a fissioning nucleus, fissioning nucleus, and also bettering our uh, resolution of potential energy surface might be helpful. Uh, we can 1,150 configurations, but uh, we can go higher than that. Um, okay, and this was this was published this year. Uh, the next topic that I'm going to talk about has not been published yet. This is, in fact, something that I work on uh, right now, and uh, it deals with uh, angular momentum of fission fragments. Um, angular momentum uh, has a strong influence on fission observables. For example, it causes anisotropy of neutron emission, and it also modifies the number of uh, neutrons and photons that are emitted in the process. Uh, at the moment, our best calculations for, um, for fission observables, uh, such as this, are, uh, are obtained from uh, reaction codes, such as Freya of Livermore Lab or CGMF from Los Alamos Lab. Uh, and here I show a very simplifying illustration of how that works. So this model takes some inputs, uh, such as fragment masses, excitation energies, or the spin distributions, angular momentum distributions, that are either taken from data or some simple non-microscopic models. Uh, they take this as an input. They perform the magic Monte Carlo modeling statistical analysis. And then what we get out are correlated observables, um, such as neutron and photon number of neutrons and photons emitted, neutron energies, uh, neutron angular uh, um, correlations, and so on. Um, and at the moment, all of these models um, either use semi-classical or statistical angular momentum distributions for their calculations. And the question is, can we use our microscopic calculation to <clears throat> inform this model um, of angular momentum distributions? Can we actually couple our calculations uh, with the reaction codes? And this is something what we try to do. Uh, at the moment, we are well positioned to, to, uh, to make this advancement. Um, so this is done in a few steps. What we try to do first is determine a scission configuration, um, which in itself is, is not trivial, as everyone uh, working in this field is going to know. Here I show just um, an example of a density of scission configuration plutonium 200, uh, 240. Uh, we use the neck value to define two fragments, so the heavy one on the left and the light one on the right. And then we unleash the angular momentum restoration um, framework um, uh, for the both fragments. So here I show the, uh, the, the spin distribution, so the probability of occupying each spin. Uh, it's a very similar to the one that I showed you before. As you see here, you have the integration over uh, beta, 
uh, but here is the change. So we have the younger momentum operator in each fragment, and we have a scission configuration, which is expanded in a basis that is not closed under rotation. So this is, uh, this is crucial because the development that I discussed before is uh, actually enables us to perform this kind of calculation to start with. And for the angular momentum of the operator in um, angular momentum operator in fragments, uh, we use this type of expression when we have the original angular momentum kernel, uh, and then we have cutoff function functions that have this shape here for the left and for the right fragment, and this is the heavy side function. So what it basically does is it cuts off for us either the left part of the space or the right part of the space. All right, uh, and we did preliminary calculations for this. Um, here on the left, um, I show the angular momentum distribution for A equals 136 fragment uh, for the fission of plutonium 240. Um, as I said, uh, defining one scission configuration is complicated. So here we have 11 different configurations where we um, constrain the, the, the dipole moment and the quadrupole moment to 345. Um, and then we vary the neck size, which basically measures how many particles are in the neck between two and three. And here I show all of the distributions, how they uh, look like between two and three. However, uh, of course, when defined the neck, nothing guarantees that the number of particles in the left and the right is going to be integer. So none of these actually does have an integer number of particles. Here I show uh, how they look like in A, Z plane uh, for each of these distributions. Um, so to extract the uh, integer number of particles from this, uh, we use a simple uh, Gaussian process. And here on the right, I show the, the distribution that we get uh, for A equals 136. Um, and I compare it to the, um, to the distribution, which is generated by Freya. So we can see that actually the difference is not that large at all. Um, we can go one step further and we can use this, distrib this distribution in Freya calculation to see how it influences variables, um, observables, um, both for neutrons and for protons. And here I show the comparison. Uh, we can see that number of neutrons emitted, both for the heavy fragment and total fragment, is somewhat lower with our microscopic distribution, uh, while the number of photons is uh, somewhat increased. And the plan, what we are doing now, is repeat uh, a similar uh, play, but not just for 11 configurations, but for in between 1,000 and 10,000 session configurations. And hopefully, this would enable us to get uh, distributions for not just A equals 136, but for other fragmentations as well. And this is an ongoing uh, work with, uh, with Nicolas Schank, uh, Jorgen Randrup, and Ramona Vogt, and two of them actually are the people who provided the uh, calculations for Freya. All right, and uh, let me just wrap up. As I said, the nuclear fission is a very uh, complicated phenomenon, and there's still a lot of theoretical work uh, to do. Density functional theory is the most uh, promising microscopic approach. Um, I have discussed two um, separated but still related topics here. The one of them is how to use symmetry stored density functional theory um, to, to describe fission at all. And I talked about a game changing, um, uh, the practical development, which enables us for the first time to restore symmetries in bases that are not closed under rotations. And then we can actually describe extremely deformed configurations. Uh, we showed in our calculations that potential energy surfaces are significantly modified by symmetry restoration and that this could influence the mass yields in fission. Um, however, to get uh, a real uh, realistic uh, estimate, so we have to probably develop a symmetry restoring time dependent GCM, which will project not just potential energy surfaces, but also collective inertias on good quantum numbers. Um, the preliminary results for microscopic distributions uh, of um, angular momenta in fissure fragments uh, look quite encouraging. Our next step is to extend them and to couple them to Freya code to get distributions for, um, for different fragmentations uh, and to see how they influence the fission observables. And there are also multiple ways in which this uh, framework can be, uh, can, can be improved. One of them is combining the particle number restoration with angular momentum restoration, since the number of particles is not um, actually integer in any of the fragments. Uh, one should also, in principle, include the effects of a finite temperature, since the fission does not happen and A equals zero, um, and so on. And with that, and with acknowledging my uh, collaborators, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Beautiful talk. Uh, so time for questions. Uh, can you please stop sharing so yes. that uh, I have access to uh,
because I did the, the number of participants doesn't fit on yes. my. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have questions, just unmute and talk or raise your hand in the chat so that I can spot you. As usual, students are absolutely welcome to ask questions. Okay, I don't see anything at the moment. Okay. Well, I have a question out of curiosity. When you say computationally expensive, maybe you can give a, to the student an order of magnitude. So how long does it take to do one calculation? Uh, one ah, calculation. Yeah. Sorry? One calculation. So the, the calculation, for example, when you calculated the, the, the uh, the, yes. restora the symmetry restoration. So. Yes. So the symmetry One restoration. Phase. Yeah. So if we do all of the all of the projections, um, and if we typically use a web node uh, with, uh, well, we don't use we use the, let's say thirty six OpenMP processes, and for the one configuration, it might be uh, between twelve hours and twenty four hours, depending. So yeah, it's a quite uh, time consuming. Okay, uh, I have a, a question from Benjamin Bali. You can unmute yourself. Ah, hi. Hi, hi Benjamin. Sir. Thank you for the talk. It's nice to see that people are doing fission and AV nuclei. Finally, start to do a symmetry projection. Uh, so my question is uh, about the interaction. You said that you used um, a skirm interaction. Which one? Yeah. Is uh, this one was the SKM star, but we can also use other ones if we want. So, I mean, it's a one, it's a proper Hamiltonian operator, this one, or is it uh, I know. <laughs> a pure function? Okay, so. Yeah. So it brings me to my to my uh, other question: is how do you compute? Uh, I mean, how do you compute? Like, so do you what kind of terms do you include? Do you include like some pairing uh, exchange terms, and how do you compute the densities? There is no pairing exchange term, I think. And we use the mixed density prescription for all. Uh, right. Yeah. OK. Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, Jacek, go on. Yeah. Yes, Peter. Uh, could you comment on the following uh, uh, aspect? Uh, namely, uh, when the nuclei proceed towards fission before the fission point, it's very likely that the uh, the formation uh, of the two fragments will become non-coaxial. Namely, you will have such a kind of motion when the two nuclei will depart in this way. So in fact, you should maybe consider the, the, the configurations of fissioning nuclei, which are not governed by the two axial the mean fields, which are touching one to another. Yeah, that's correct. That's possible. I guess that would that would require the triaxial calculation, right? Well, or two axial shapes in a okay. two-center model. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you're right. We did not consider this type of uh, configurations. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? I don't see anybody. I saw, I saw Nico had a comment. If you want, maybe to. Ask it, Nico, directly. Yeah, I'd like to to know my, my my feeling about the nuclear polarizability. There's some indications that the nuclear polarizability may increase with excitation energy. And as we know, the, the, the decrease uh, in the nuclear polarizability lead to these uh, magic uh, magic numbers, these dips in the in the nuclear polarizability, but an enhancement of the nuclear polarizability may eventually, uh, in, a, in a macroscopic view, may eventually break the nucleus at high, uh, a high excitation energy. See, so something that I would like to, to explore experimentally, but maybe it's just, uh, it's just some nonsense, you know, what I, want to, I wanted to know here, Peter's uh, expertise on this. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about it so we can maybe discuss it uh, in our usual exchanges. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Peter. Great talk. <laughs> Okay, great talk. Uh, Robbie, last question, Robbie. You can unmute uh, yourself. 
Okay, hi. Um, I just have a naive question. How do you think about fission? Do you think of it as being a slow process or a long process? I mean, do the nuclei have time to sort of um, uh, go into the shape which is the least energy or doesn't it qu happen quite quickly so that it doesn't always go to uh, what you would think of as being the lowest energy or is that included in a sense in the way you're doing the calculation? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I Well, I think the first as I showed on the first slide, probably it was not so visible, is that different parts of the equation actually proceed by different, in different times. So the deformation part is extremely quick and then the rest is gonna be uh, slower, right? Uh, but what we assume here is the, really the, the adiabatic uh, approximation. So we assume that the, the, the state does have time actually to, to relax to the, to the ground state. Basically the, the, the surface that we use actually does not have excitations. It's the lowest energy that we have for the Q2, Q3 combination for the part of law for the formation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I think uh, I, it's a pity to interrupt this beautiful discussion, but thank, let's thank Peter again. And I call the next speaker, Luis Robledo.